welcome to the Centre Think Tank podcast uh, in conversation. Today I am joined by Tracy Crouch, the Member of Parliament for Chatham and Ailsham since 2010. She also served in two roles as a Parliamentary Under Secretary of State, both for Sport, Civil Society and Loneliness, and also for Sport, Heritage and Tourism. Welcome to the conversation, Tracy. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Great to have you on. So the first question I thought I'd ask, and it's it's more a one about your general political views, is whether you consider yourself a, a one nation conservative, which is a term often used for those people who are sort of more in the centre ground, but are, are still very much conservatives. And, and what do you think that term actually means? I've always considered myself a one nation Tory. Um, I joined the party in, gosh, 1990, maybe? 1991, um, John Major was Prime Minister. I was very taken by his journey uh, into politics and in particular into Conservative politics. And of course, at that time, there was a sort of kind of real difference between the Conservative Party and the Labour Party. Um, I was studying at um, school, my, my A-level politics, and, you know, we were learning all about socialism um and um conservatism at that point and and just everything about John Major sung to me and he claimed to himself to be a one nation Tory obviously very different to Margaret Thatcher who had preceded him and and uh, and I was basically captured by that and and very much sort of kind of talked to me at that particular time in my life you know he was a man from a single parent family I was in a single parent family He'd been to grammar school. I was at a grammar school um, and he'd gone on to run the country. And for me, it made me feel like that I could do anything. You know, that the future was you know, was very much open to me. So, of course, in the, the local elections recently, um, you know, the Conservatives, they lost both in, in seats and also councils and, uh, and other political parties, be they Green, Labour uh, and the Lib Dems all, all gain seats. So what are your thoughts on those results? But also, how do you see the Conservative Party regrowing from here? So look, I really genuinely try not to get overexcited about local elections and what they mean in terms of the national picture. And I've I and I've maintained that position when we've done well as well. Um, because I do think that actually people do vote in local elections for a whole variety of reasons. Sometimes it's to give the government, whoever that government is, a bloody nose. And I was on the the, you know, the sort of kind of the up, if you like, of that back in 2009 when I was already selected for um uh for Chatham and Ellsford and we saw seats that were solid Labour seats you know completely change to Tory seats but actually a lot of it wasn't necessarily about David Cameron it wasn't about um the uh you know the forthcoming elections or anything like that it was actually because they were just a bit fed up locally that the, the potholes hadn't been fixed you know potholes are not a new phenomenon by the way <laughs> the bins hadn't been collected likewise you know, so actually there was a lot of there's a lot of individual nuance at local elections um but nonetheless you know people get very excited about them they do the, you know sort of kind of take a temperature uh and it would be foolish of the party to uh, not take notice of, of this and you know to to actually be clear about what it means and and how you can engage with people in different in different parts of the country. I also think it's very foolish if there is a one size fits all approach to this. You know, the issues that are important to people in the southeast are not the same as the issues that are important to those in the northeast. Um, and so, you know, when when you talk about a national campaign, it has to be a national campaign with local bits to it. Um, and I feel very strongly about that. And I think that. You know, when we're coming out with national policy, which is designed to suit or fit red wall seats, that's great and that has to happen, but it's not necessarily of great importance or equivalence to voters in my constituency or elsewhere in the southeast. And so therefore you have to be thinking about those policies as well. 
So during your time as the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State, you worked a lot on changing gambling rules. And, and I read that one of the reasons that you, you'd actually given for that was, you know, in your own constituency, you know, the number of, of low income individuals who ended up losing, you know, vast amounts of money, especially compared to the amount that they were earning on betting machines. So what, why did you feel that that was such a large issue, you know, especially in your area? Well, my area is really interesting. It's sort of kind of got a bit of everything in it. Um, and um, there are urban areas with real deprivation. Um, there, there are wards that are on the most deprived index. And then there are areas that are relatively affluent. Mm -hmm. And what is really telling is that um, the bookmakers don't have uh, retail positions in any affluent areas. They're all in the in the poorer, most deprived communities. Um, you know, th there isn't a uh, a bookmaker in Aylesford, for example, um, but there's probably four in the space of, you know, less than a mile in, in parts of Chatham. And so, um, you know, it is clear who, who they're targeting. You know, it was clear that they wanted to target those who are desperate to have money in whatever way that you know they can get money um and gambling sort of kind of preys on that hope and um the thing about the machines is that you win big but you also lose big and you know and there was you know countless examples of of people constituents who you know would play these machines they'd win like eight thousand pounds amazing that was life-changing to many people uh in those parts of those communities and yet they wouldn't save it they wouldn't put it towards you know paying off debt or you know supporting families or whatever it would in many cases go straight back in the machine and you know that was that that unfortunately is you know the problem with those machines is that they would prey on the most you know vulnerable and those that that desire that that huge win so, of course, you, you were one of the people who, who really led the change to uh, reduce maximum stakes on fixed odds betting the terminals uh, from £100 down to, to £2. So why did you campaign so so passionately for that change? I know you, you eventually resigned from your position as well um, because the, the government hadn't implemented it as quickly. And, and, and what were the main arguments in favour of, of making those changes? Well, the, the change specifically from £100 to £2, you know, was a really important policy aspect. It was something that people were, were calling for. It was all to do with equivalence with other betting machines, but also um, it was an acknowledgement around things like the spin um, uh, time, the spin cycle of, of the machines, um, you know, the fact that you could lose, um, you know, £100 in 20 seconds. I mean, that's extraordinary, right? So um, trying to actually limit that loss um, was a really important aspect of the policy. And we won the policy, right? And the policy change was a fundamental part of the gambling review. Um, and it was agreed across government that the, the point of impl implementation became the contentious aspect of it. Um, and, you know, with the attempt to delay it from the April implementation date to the October implementation date, which is what the Chancellor wanted. And thank goodness we won the argument. OK, it took my resignation and then a sort of kind of huge foray in, in Parliament. Um, but thank goodness, because if you recall back in 2019, we ended up having much more important things to be, well, not more important, but you know, certainly time consuming things to be discussing around Brexit. We would never have had had it done if it hadn't have come in in April. So uh, looking at the situation now, do you think there's any more that the, the government or gambling companies themselves to, can do to ensure that the gambling itself is safer? Well, the government's just obviously published its own gambling white paper. I mean, I think it's, it's a shame it's been delayed um, for so long. Um, but let's be clear, it's made huge steps forward in terms of recognising harm and harmful gambling. And uh, it looks at various different aspects of that, um, including um, advertising on, on football shirts, which has become a hugely contentious uh, issue as well. Um, and I think that, that most people, most campaigners are very happy with the content of, of the white paper. There's always issues around its actual implementation. And, and I think we'd all agree that we'd quite like to see it sooner rather than later. But 
you know, that's the nature of the beast. And I think that, you know, the fact that there's there's major policy aspects that have been so sort of kind of resolved in many respects, I think is a, is a massive leap forward. So in 2021, you were the chair of the independent fan-led review of football governance. So what recommendations in that report do you feel were the, the most important to ensuring that football clubs are, are properly run going forwards and in the future? I mean, I was it was a great pleasure to be the chair of the football review. I've you know, long sort of kind of spoken about the importance of football in communities, and it took, you know, sort of a couple of crises in football for people who don't care about football to understand why football is important. And I think in the past, politicians have, have always thought that football is about 90 minutes and actually, you know, it took Berry to, to disappear and it took the European Super League and, to, you know, Macclesfield and other sort of kind of seismic events in, in football for politicians who don't care about the sport to suddenly realise and appreciate why football is actually much greater in many respects than the sport itself. And so, you know, the football review is really about how can we protect clubs from disappearing? How can we protect the long-term sustainability of English football? And, um, you know, within that, the recommendations are very firmly around things like the independent regulator, real-time financial monitoring, business plans, and so on. It's not about interference is about making sure that those those bits of our community that are so mean meaningful to the kind of those communities continue to exist going forward and it's only when they're not there that people begin to appreciate how important they were um, and they're important on so many different levels there's a social aspect to it um, we saw that in covid where you know people who whose only interaction with other human beings could be on a Saturday afternoon, standing on the terraces of their local football club. We're not always talking about Premier League clubs here, by the way. We're talking about grassroots clubs with a you know, couple of hundred people who rock up. Um, you know, that that kind of interaction was was really, you know, evident, you know, the impact of it not being there. Football clubs are always the first to put up their hands and say, you know, will be a COVID vaccination centre or, you know, we can host nurses here or we can do educational aspects here. It's quite often forgotten because we're too busy shaking our fists at, you know, profits or losses or what have you. And I think that actually, um, you know, that's what the football review was all about, was sort of kind of recognising the whole ecosystem um, of football. So how do you feel that we can communicate, I think, the community aspect of football, which is one that I think is is so often overlooked to people in politics? Because, as you said, there's this massive disconnect between the two, and it's it's often difficult to, to you know, have politicians understand just how core it is to some of those communities. I, I, I think, sadly, I think crisis in football has begun to sort of kind of show why um, football clubs are important. Um, I think that politicians sort of kind of who don't care about football, who don't follow a team, um, you know, perhaps prefer a different sport or whatever, you know, just perhaps need to spend some time with their own grassroots clubs and see what it is they're doing beyond the Saturday or the Wednesday or the Tuesday. You know, it's like it's so much more than just the game itself. You know, and so many clubs came into their own during COVID and are continuing to do that work. You know, quite often, um, you know, when you think about other policy areas like social prescribing, you know, our, our link workers that are in GP practices are turning to sports clubs to say, well, how can you help us with isolation? How can you help us with our reducing diabetes? How can you help us with... Um, you know, other aspects, you know, dementia, for example, engaging people with memory loss, you know, so actually, I think there is a, a greater recognition, not just of football, sport in general, what it can do to contribute in other areas of policy as well. So are there any ways that reforms to, to football governments could go further, in your opinion? So especially when it comes to clubs falling into bankruptcy and, and that sort of area of things? 
well, certainly other sports are looking at some of the recommendations within the football governance reviews to see how they can do things differently uh, in their own sports and different in different ways. So cricket may well be looking at some of the governance regulations, um, uh, whereas rugby could be looking at some of the financial distribution aspects of it. Um, so, you know, I, I, I definitely think there's, it's piqued an interest in uh, other sports as to how um, you know, they can make themselves both financially sustainable for the future, but also how they can improve their own governance situation. Well, that was the, the final question. And thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. If people want to find out more about you, either um, on the Internet or via social media, how can they do so? Well, I wouldn't believe everything you read on the Internet, um, but <laughs> um, uh, I, I'm on the, all the usual social media channels um, and you know, just grateful to you guys. Uh, and to everyone who's still sort of kind of banging the drum for um, uh, centre politics. I think the ground is is very fertile and, and actually, you know, we do better when we come together in, 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 on these issues and, and forge consensus. And thankfully for, for me, my portfolios, uh, all of all of the portfolios that I ha had lent itself to cross party working, but also cross departmental working where we were enabled to have that consensus and to push forward, I think, some major changes in policy. Well, thank you so much for coming on uh, and thank you for speaking to me today. You're welcome.